Amen. Amen. Now, last week, I asked you what promises of God you are believing and trusting God for, and I know you must have uh, written that down somewhere. And I mentioned a few things many of us uh, do expect God uh, to come through for us. Uh, one is good health, healing, uh, money, a job, uh, businesses. Uh, at times, if you are not married, a young man, a wife. Uh, if you are married, you don't have a child, like Abraham, a child. A house or a ministry, we mentioned those as some of the things many of us uh, would be waiting for and believing and trusting God to come through for us. And then I ask you, how long are you prepared to wait for God to fulfill your promise? Uh, and I ask you last, is it one day, one week, one year, 10 years, 20 years? How long are you prepared to wait? Because between uh, the time of promise and the time of fulfillment, of a promise, there's normally a time element. And many a time, we expect God to come through immediately. At times it does, many a time it does not. So we need to be prepared to wait, and we need to be prepared to wait as long as is necessary. Now, in Genesis chapter 17 and 18, we see Abraham had waited for 24 years since God promised a near to him and an heir from his own flesh and blood. So God had promised that to him. But so far, up to where we are now, it's 24 years later, Abraham has not received that promise. He is still waiting. So you need to ask yourself, if it were you, would you have waited that long, uh, or would you have given up? Now we see in lesson tonight that Abraham is 99 years old, and Sarah is 90 years old, and they are still childless. What a challenge. What really a challenge. At 100 years old, 99, and 90, your wife is 90, you don't have a child, and God is still saying you're going to be father of many nations, and at one time we can start to think that God is not telling the truth. But also we see that God stepped in at the right moment and indeed confirmed that Sarah would have a child the following year, and but we see also a situation where both Abraham and Sarah, at different times, at, at different places, they both laughed. They laughed that, that laughter of, of disbelief. They trusted God. They knew God would come through. But at this point, they are like, really, God? Will you come through? When I'm 99 years old, my wife is 90, will you, God, come through? And they laughed. That laughter there, many of us have laughed it because at times you wonder whether really God will come through. But we see God responding in a very firm way, and he said, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too difficult? Is there anything God cannot do? And that is the answer you and I need to have in our minds, that there's nothing whatsoever. There's nothing too hard. There's nothing too difficult for God. If God has promised it, he'll come through. Whether it's 100 years, whether it's 200 years, whatever time is going to take, Lord God Almighty, this God with whom nothing is impossible, he is going to come through because he is powerful. And our key lesson tonight is, true faith trusts the Almighty God to fulfill all his covenant promises to his people no matter what. True faith trusts the Almighty God to fulfill all his covenant promises to his people no matter what. God will fulfill his covenant covenant promises to his people no matter what. And true faith needs to believe that. I have to do two divisions. The first division is God confirms the covenant, Genesis 17. God confirms the covenant, Genesis 17. And the second division is God confirms Isaac's birth. God confirms Isaac's birth, Genesis 18, verses 1 to 15. So two divisions, God confirms the, co the covenant and God confirms Isaac's birth. So let's go to the first division there, look at God confirming the covenant. Of course, God had already given this uh, promise to Abraham actually three times in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, and Genesis 17. Uh, the way we are, God is repeating it, meaning that God has not forgotten Many a time when we read the word of God and we see repeated scriptures giving us promises, it's not redundancy, it's God emphasizing that his promises must come uh, through. 
And now we know it's about 13 years have passed between Genesis 16 and 17. Remember last week where we were, where God was talking to Abraham. Remember the circumcision where Abraham was told to circumcise everybody. Now between where we ended last week and where we are today, uh, we see that there are 13 years that have passed between Genesis 16 and 17. And during those, those years of silence, uh, we see Abraham and Sarah must have believed that Hagar and Ishmael and, uh, uh, must have solved their childlessness issue. Last week, actually, is where we saw Hagar was in the desert and uh, uh, met uh, God in the desert and was promised this child called uh, Ishmael. So we see what is happening here now. Thirteen years later, nothing has happened. And we see that Hagar must have shared how God must have met, him in the, met her in the desert and rescued her and told her to go back home and submit. So Hagar must have enjoyed telling that story. I, I met God and God told me to come back. And God told me I have a child. He even told me to name that child Ishmael. And Ishmael means God hears. So Abraham and Sarah must have figured this must be then the son of promise. If God has already intervened and told this uh, slave girl to come back, well, I think that's confirmation, God, uh, this is the son of the promise. Meanwhile, in those 13 years, from the time of conception of Ishmael up to now, Ishmael had grown into a young, fine man. Now he's a teenager, and uh, this again must have led Abraham Sarai to believe that really, this indeed was the son of the promise. Now, 13 years later. But then again, as we'll see tonight, God stepped into the picture, and he comes in to repeat the same thing he had said even before. So today in verses 1 and 2, we see of Genesis 17, we see Abraham was 99 years old, uh, and the Lord stepped in and said to him, I'm, I'm God Almighty, that is Jehovah El Shaddai. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless, then I'll make my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. So God has come. Now remember the background we just talked about. These people had resigned to the fact that Ishmael maybe is the son of the promise, and now God has come. And now God reveals himself with this covenant name, uh, God Almighty, El Shaddai. That's the name we love to uh, call God as El Shaddai. And God Almighty means he's the all-powerful God. He's the sovereign God of the universe. He is God with whom nothing is impossible. He's the God who spoke the world into existence. He is the God who is there when we are in trouble to save us. He is a creative God. He is a God uh, with whom nothing is hard or impossible to do. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. And he's the one who holds everything together. Everything today is held together by this powerful God, El Shaddai. Very, very powerful. And so God tells Abraham to continue to walk before him faithfully and to be blameless or to live in high integrity. Again, Abraham was already uh, credited with faith. Remember, he believed God. And God is telling him to continue to do that because he's already justified. He's already uh, saved by God. He's already forgiven. He's not guilty. He's blameless. But God is telling him, please continue to do that. So God was happy with Abraham. But also we see God pr uh, promising to fulfill his covenant with Abraham and increase him greatly. So God is telling him, I've not forgotten. I know what I've promised you, and I know what I need to do. And I even know what you're thinking, that Ishmael is the son of the promise, and I'm going to re uh, tell you that he's not. In verses 3 to 5, we see Abraham fa falling face down in abject humility and worshiping God. He worshiped God. Every time God spoke to Abraham, Abraham worshiped God. He was really a man of God, very humble, very meek, and uh, he worshipped God here. And we see here, then God uh, confirming that Abraham will be the father of many nations. He's going to be the father of many nations. And therefore God changed Abraham's name from Abram and the father of many. Abram means the father of many, and he changed that name to Abraham, uh, the father of many nations. So God adds the word nation. So Abraham was not going to be father of many people. Uh, just like many of you are fathers of many people, Abraham was going to be a father of many nations. Many nations are going to come out of Abraham. A, a very big distinction to God uh, and the need to change that name, that Abraham becomes 
the father of all nations. And he promised to make him very fruitful, and nations and kings would come from him. So God is going on to add, not only is Abraham going to be the father of many nations, uh, uh, nations and kings would come from him. In verse 7 and 8, God promised to establish an everlasting covenant uh, with Abraham and his descendants, and God was going to be their God, and he's going to give them the land of Canaan. So God again, just uh, again re-emphasizing and re, uh, um, speaking uh, the same pro, uh, promises he had given to Abraham. Uh, I'm going to make you fruitful, and I'm going to be your God. I'm going to give you the land of Canaan, so just be ready, Abraham. I'm going to do all these things. In verses 9 to 14, God gave Abraham the outward sign of circumcision, and this is where he was told to circumcise every male child on the eighth day, and every servant who was in his compound, he was going to be uh, circumcised. Now, let's talk about a, a little bit about this circumcision. What is it? First of all, this circumcision is an outward sign, and it was to distinguish Abraham's male descendants from other people. It was setting them apart. Sanctification process. God is always setting his people apart from others. And in the Old Testament, the way God set, a, set apart his people was through the sign of circumcision. So if you agree to circumcision, you become part of God's family. If you reject it, then you are to be uh, excluded. This circumcision also confirmed the covenant blessings for the whole family unit through the patriarch. So once the patriarch or the head of the family was circumcised, the covenant blessings of God was confirmed for that home for that family. Remember, women here are not being circumcised, but through the male circumcision, all those who are in that household were part of covenant blessings of God. Very, very important. It also served as a seal of obedience within the community that identified with God. So once you agree to be circumcised, uh, then uh, it was a seal of obedience that then you are part of God's uh, community, part of God's family. It was a seal of obedience. Because you could have refused, and then, uh, of course, then you don't become part of God's family. It symbolized cutting off of the old life of self-effort and failure and sin. So cutting off of the flesh was the same as cutting off old life, self-effort, failure, and sin. It also related to faith, to the great hope of physical descendants of Abraham's Savior. So once you again were circumcised, it means you are waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because uh, one of Abraham's offspring was going to be the Messiah. Now, if a person did not uh, accept to be circumcised, then of course that person was, uh, would be cut off, thrown aside, uh, just like the foreskin of the male organ is thrown away. So it was serious business. So you are either in or out. And if you wanted to belong to God's people, then you had to undergo this sign. Again, to emphasize, this was an outright sign of what God was doing inside. And today we have many other outright signs, like baptism, it's an outright sign. Uh, when you're baptized, you're dipped in water. That's an outward sign of what God is doing in the inside, and there are very many other outright signs. In verses 15 and 16, we also see God changing Sarai's name uh, from Sarai, which means pr princess, uh, to Sarah, again, mother of many nations. So Abraham and Sarah, their names meaning many nations. Mother, now here she's mother of many nations. And God said he would surely bless her and would give her, and she would give Abraham a son. Now you remember there was a confusion before because God had told Abraham the son would be from his own flesh and blood. And because Sarah was not mentioned, a Hagar project came into being because the reasoning was Sarah had not been mentioned. Now here God deals with that confusion. Here God says, uh, Sarah would have a, a child. Uh, Sarah would bear Abraham uh, a child. And that is the son of promise. And so Sarah would be the mother of many nations, and kings or people would come from her, just like Abraham. So again, God is lining up everything, and now it's very clear that it's both Abraham and Sarah who would bring forth this son. Verse 17 and 18, we see Abraham falling face down and at this point, Abraham now, in an act of disbelief, he laughs and say to himself, now he's talking to himself, you need to know that, 
He is talking to himself. And he said, Will a son be born to a man, a hundred years old? Now remember he was 99, so he rounded that up. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 99? Okay. And Abraham said to God, If only now, this is spoken now, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Amazing. You see, after waiting for 24 years, even when God restates the promise, Abraham in, in his heart uh, has those questions. We said last time, it's okay to question God. It's all right to have a conversation with God. Here, Abraham is actually only speaking to himself in utter disbelief, and he's asking, is it possible at 100 for man, at 90 years for woman, to have a child? And then Abraham, being very practical, he tells God, ah, please God, just bless this son of ours called Isaac. And you see how God responds to this. But God said, listen to God, God said, yes, so remember Abraham had not spoken. He was just reasoning in his heart. But see what God says. Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. Uh -huh. Amazing. Isn't God amazing? He tells him even the name of the son who will be born. His name, you will call him Isaac. And God goes further to say, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant uh, for his descendants after him. So God confirming, Sarah, yes, we'll have a child at 90. Yes, Abraham, you have a child at 99, 100. And you'll name that child Isaac. You see, the more we have a conversation with God, the more we engage with God's word, the more things become clearer, the more God is able to clarify. If today you are in doubt about an issue, something, please talk to God because God will continue to clarify issues until it's very clear to you. Tonight, not only is Abraham knowing he's going to have a child, uh, he knows the name of the child chosen by God. But we see also additionally, verse 20, God promised to bless Ishmael and make him fruitful because, of course, Abraham had asked, and uh, what about Ishmael? And he would be a father of 12 rulers and become a great nation. Remember last time we said, now this Ishmael is the father of the Arab nation. And, of course, they are blessed. You know how wealthy and you know all the oil they control and all the power they have in the world and all the money. So really God blessed Ishmael. So really again, God keeping his uh, word there. But God covenant, God again going on, but my covenant would be with Isaac. Uh, and Isaac, by the way, means laughter. Sarah would laugh. Remember, both Sarah and Abraham laughed. Uh, that sarcastic laughter. Now for sure they, they will laugh with joy. Laughter of joy because... They've gotten this child of the promise. And, uh, and God also, God adds something here. Uh, this Isaac would be born by this time next year. So again, not only do they know the name of the child, uh, they know that that child is going to be born in one year's time. And we are told here, Abraham believed God and circumcised every male in his household, actually including Ishmael, including uh, Abraham himself, he was circumcised. Uh, we had a conversation with leaders on Saturday, and they were wondering who circumcised Abraham. Uh, we are not told in the Bible, uh, but those of you who are creative, you can start to research and find out who circumcised Abraham, because we know Abraham circ circumcised everybody else, but who circumcised uh, Abraham? Uh, that is your homework. Find out. Uh, and it's not written here. It's not important, but just in case you like... Uh, uh, lifting heavy weights, that's one you should uh, lift. Find out who circumcised Abraham. Now, let's talk a little bit about covenant because we see here God again coming through to, co uh, to fulfill this covenant with, uh, with uh, Abraham. What is covenant? Now, in verse 2, we see the Lord God Almighty told Abraham to walk blamelessly before him and he would establish a covenant uh, with him and multiply his dis uh, descendants. Now, a covenant is a promise of God made to an individual or a group of people and is frequently accompanied by a sign. So it's a promise. A covenant is a promise uh, to an individual or a group of people. In this case, God's covenant was with Abraham, between God and Abraham. Uh, a covenant can be conditional or unconditional. An example of, an condi of a conditional covenant is God's covenant with Israel. In, the, in this covenant, God promised to bless the people of Israel if they obeyed his commandments. 
If you go to uh, Exodus 28, you can see that Exodus 28, Exodus 28, Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28, you can see that covenant where God is saying, if you do this, I'll do this. If you do this, if you obey, all these things will happen. If you don't obey, all these things will uh, again happen. So a conditional covenant is always, you must do this for God to do this. An example of a conditional covenant is God's covenant with Abraham. In this covenant, God said he would make Abraham into a great nation and all the people of the world will be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. And there was nothing for Abraham to do, uh, just to believe. And uh, that was it. Oftentimes, like we said, God's promises can seem impossible from a human perspective. But what is hard and laughable uh, for man, it's not difficult for God. Because like we've seen, God is Jehovah El Shaddai. God does. God can and does keep every, promises, uh, every promise he makes in his word. God does. Uh, he keeps every promise he makes in his word. And this brings us to our first principle. The almighty God can be trusted to keep his word and grow our faith. The almighty God can be trusted to keep his word and grow our faith. God can be trusted to keep his circum, uh, to keep his covenant, to keep his promises. Because he is the Lord Almighty. Abraham trusted God, circumcised all his men by faith, and God kept his promises. Now, what promises of God are you holding on to, and what outward act of obedience show that you're trusting God to keep his word? We've talked about many, many, many uh, promises. Me and you could be waiting for God to fulfill. The question here, what outward acts of obedience uh, are there to demonstrate that you're trusting God? It's one thing for you to expect God to do something. It's another thing for you to act uh, outwardly like God is going to do uh, fulfill that promise. Abraham circumcised everybody. He himself was circumcised at 99, and that was outward sign that he trusted God. In what specific ways has your faith grown significantly as you awaited God to come through? Abraham's faith grew. Your faith needs to grow as you wait God uh, to confirm or to fulfill his promises. It's not time to doubt. Remember, Abraham also uh, faltered here and there. He wavered here and there. Uh, but remember, his heart was tuned to God, and God uh, credited him with righteousness. You and I, we need to grow our faith as we wait for God to come uh, through. Now quickly, let's go to a second division and look at God's confirmation of Isaac's birth. Now we're in chapter 18, and we see then the Lord appear to Abraham uh, near the great trees of Mamre uh, while he was having a siesta. Abraham was just resting in the heat of the afternoon, uh, taking a nap. He must have eaten a bit of ugali, and he was enjoying himself, and now it's very hot to work. You know, in the Middle East, uh, during summer, it's very hot. Now he's just having this siesta outside his tent. And when he looked up, he saw the three men standing nearby, and he, of course, at this time, I don't think he knew who they were. And, but he hurried to meet them. He bowed down to the ground. A humble man. Uh, a man who was always very meek. This man, Abraham. And uh, we see he bowing down before them. And uh, we see uh, him receiving them. And we see him inviting them to in, into his tent and generously offering to prepare them a midday meal and uh, uh, refreshments for them. And the visitors obliged. So these men were passing by. Abraham sees them, goes to meet them, invites them in, and actually offers to have them prepared a meal, and, and they accepted. Uh, we are told that Abraham hurried to the tent, uh, told Sarah to bake some bread. Uh, then he, ran, he went to his servant, uh, selected a choice a tender calf, three-year-old, and uh, he told him to prepare. And then he brought the food, he brought the cards, milk, and uh, everything that was prepared, set it before these men, and while they ate, he stood at a distance. I told you he had eaten something himself. So he's not eating. <laughs> he's not eating with them. But as it could be for respect, because he respected them, 
Uh, he just wanted them to be well taken care of. Actually, he was serving them. He was a servant. He act, actually told them he is their servant. Here, he was just serving them a great honor. You and I need to learn something from Abraham. Strangers. And you remember in Hebrew it says, we should be hospitable because uh, many have entertained what? Uh, strangers, but they've ended up entertaining angels. And the case here is Abraham. He's entertaining actually God himself. We've told men to open their homes so then men can come and do fellowship there. People of God can come and fellowship there. And you refuse to open your home. You are missing out on entertaining strangers and entertaining God in your home. Here Abraham opened up his home. He ended up entertaining God, making a meal, preparing a meal for God himself. So they've eaten. Abraham has served them well. They are very satisfied. They have had enough to drink here. They've drunk musik. Of course, they were given cards there. And now they are good. And they ask, where is your wife Sarah? So we know the purpose of their coming. It wasn't the food. It wasn't even Abraham. It was Sarah. But you can see the role uh, hospitality plays. If Abraham had not invited these men in, they would have passed by. And there's a song that says, Pass me not, thou great... <laughs> Thou gracious Savior. That's the correct? Yeah, pass me, don't pass me by. And you and I need to be very, very careful because many of our blessings have passed us by because we failed to see the opportunity. The time of our breakthrough came and passed by because we were not focused. And we thought our uh, people who wanted to come and visit with us, maybe they're just coming to give us a headache. Here they ask in verse 9, where is your wife Sarah? They asked. They are in the tent, Abraham uh, replied. Then one of them said, this must have been God himself, Jesus Christ. By the way, uh, the Lord here is pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ before he was born uh, as a son of man. So he said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. So now it's very specific. Remember just a while ago, uh, God had told Abraham, uh, that Sarah will bear him a son by this time next year. So these two incidences are back to back uh, to one another. Maybe a few days have passed, uh, but not so long ago. So still the same time next year, and he says so. But Sarah was listening. Uh, she was listening uh, in her tent near the kitchen, and she, so she laughed to herself, and she thought. This is again in her thought, just like Abraham. Remember, Abraham was thinking uh, when he was again uh, caught by God. Uh, and Sarah here is thinking, after I'm, I'm worn out, listen to her, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, uh, will, will I now have this pleasure? She didn't speak it, she actually thought it. And listen to this Jehovah El Shaddai, verse 13, 14. Then the Lord told Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? And listen to this, is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Amazing. God knows our thoughts. We are told in the Bible, God looks at the heart, and God knows our thoughts. Indeed, God is able to design every thought, uh, everything we're imagining in our life, and here uh, is able to see Sarah's thought and confirming that indeed, she will have a child, and God will return to her. But also you need to up, uh, note there, the appointed time. Your and my promise has the appointed time. There is an appointment. Every time you're expecting something from God, uh, know that there's an appointed time. So you and I may rush. You and I may feel disappointed. We may think that God has forgotten, but God has an appointed time that he is going to come through. And here God says, I'll return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Today, you should be very, very relieved, because if you're waiting for something from God, a promise, a covenant, something that you know God has promised, uh, then you know there's an appointed time, and you don't need to despair. Indeed, you can tell God, if it's possible, let me know, is it the same time next year, or is it the same night, time next two years, or whatever, uh, God will give you a clue, but please don't give up because God has the appointed time. And here we are told Sarah was afraid, so she said she lied. You see, these people are credited with righteousness, 
They are still telling lies just like you and me. We are born again, we are children of God, but what happens when there is pressure? We lie. That doesn't mean that our salvation go, it just means we need to repent, confess. So here she lied, and she said, I did not laugh. But you know, if you tell God you didn't laugh, what do you expect God is going to tell you? Yeah. And God told, told her, yes, you did laugh. Now, remember it was in her heart, so this must have been very strange for her, because then at this point she must have realized, really, this is God. This is Jehovah El Shaddai. This is the God who designs the thoughts uh, in our hearts. And she said, yes, you did laugh. She was afraid. This brings us to our second principle. The Almighty God can be trusted to keep his word and do the impossible. The Almighty God can be trusted to keep his word and do the impossible. God will always keep his word. He'll always keep his promises. He'll always keep his covenant. There is no word that is written concerning an issue that God will not be, uh, that will not be fulfilled. So we can trust God. We can trust God to keep his word, but also to do the impossible. At night, at 100 years old, Sarah is going to, uh, Abraham is going to get a child. At 90 years old, Sarah is going to get a child. You and I, we know that if you look at ourselves now, a man is fruitful maybe until some ages of 50 or 60 or thereabout. If you push it too hard, a woman maybe by 30, 40, 45 maybe, if you push issues. But these ones were far beyond 90 years old for a lady, 100 years old for a man. God waited until they would not be able to say it's by their own strength they got the child of the promise. It's a miracle child. And that is what God is waiting for you and I. God is not going to come through if you are going to take credit for anything. God is going to wait until uh, you know it's God who comes through. If God blesses you with whatever you are looking for, God is going to wait until you run out of every possible uh, route or every possible way of getting that promise. Because when he comes through, then you know, indeed, this was by God's hand. So the Almighty God is able to do the impossibles in our lives. So what promises of God seem impossible or unbelievable to you? You could be an old lady, an old man, and you're thinking it's over. No, it's possible with God. God can do it. How can you move forward by faith uh, expecting God to do the impossible in your life? Whatever it is you're expecting God to do, he can do it because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. What doubts are you hiding from God? Abraham laughed, Sarah laughed, but God knew what they were laughing. They were laughing and he confirmed their doubt. You and I, if you have any doubt, take it to God and God will confirm that your promise is on the way. What may change if you trusted God and you trusted God's promises? Of course, if you trust God and his promises, then you become very confident that God is going to come through. And I pray that is your position tonight. In conclusion, please remember that true faith trusts the Almighty God to fulfill all his covenant promises to his people no matter what. God will always come through. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this passage where you are teaching us you are El Shaddai, God who is able to do the impossible in our life. Help us to understand this. Help us to share with those who need to hear this message tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.